Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It looks like we are ready to go. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today for the webinar, What is an AED? featuring Zoll Medical. Um, I My name is Amber Hubbard, and I'm the Marketing Automation, the marketing automation, automation Specialist at AED Superstore. I am joined by Kelly Parker, who is the Strategic Distribution Account Manager at Zoll. We are very excited to have the opportunity to teach everyone more about AEDs and what AED options you have with Zoll. Before I turn things over to Kelly, there are a few things I want to mention before we get started. First, by joining us today, you are automatically entered into a drawing for a chance to win a free Zoll AED+. We will draw the winner at the end of the presentation and you must be present to win, so stick with us. If you do win, I will be reaching out to you via the chat option in GoToMeeting, um, so I will get your shipping information then. Second, since we have so many people joining us today, please mute yourself and turn your camera off. This will give all our attendees the best experience. If you have any questions or comments during the demo, please feel free to type them into the chat option as well. We will be doing a Q&A at the end, and we will get to them during that portion of the presentation. So without further ado, I will let Kelly take it away. Thanks, Amber. And hello, everybody. Good afternoon. As Amber mentioned, my name is Kelly Parker. I'm based in Houston, Texas. For anybody else out there in Texas, hopefully you are safe. We had some pretty crazy weather come through earlier. Um, but I'm really excited. Today we're talking about my favorite thing, AEDs. Um, and so I'll, I'll jump right in. If you've ever watched a, a TV medical drama, Chances are you have seen someone shocked back to life, right? When the doctor yells clear and delivers a jolt of electricity uh, into someone's chest, and then all of a sudden their heart's beating again. Well, the machine that the doctors are using is called a defibrillator. And those defibrillator machines aren't necessarily limited uh, to the hospital setting. In fact, AEDs uh, are automated external defibrillators and they can be found in the public in our places of work. Um, they can even be used at home, in our schools, etc. No, I never follow up on it. Today, that yeah. is going to be what we're talking about. Uh, what is an AED and what are AEDs used for? They're used for reviving someone who's in cardiac arrest. Kristen, next slide, please. Now, although cardiac arrest and heart attacks are often linked as one and the same, there are distinct differences that I have to point out. A heart attack is when part of or a portion of the blood supply to our heart is blocked. There's some sort of obstruction um, and we're not getting as much blood as we need. Now, like I said, distinctly different is a cardiac arrest, which happens when our hearts do something that's called fibrillates. There is a, something abnormal happening with the electrical activity of our heart, and it begins quivering or beating erratically and uncontrollably. Oftentimes what happens at this point is blood flow completely stops. So uh, we will essentially look as though we're passed out. We'll, we won't be breathing, we'll be unresponsive, um, and it's very dire. Now, a couple different things can cause us to go into cardiac arrest which I'd like to touch on because, again, a heart attack is oftentimes associated with age. It can be associated with physical fitness level or, or our overall health. Whereas cardiac arrest can be caused by an underlying heart condition or heart damage, but also electrocution. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm getting some background noise for a few folks. Yeah, um, if everyone can please mute. Um, somebody is unmuted and it is creating some feedback. Okay. All right, I'll jump back in. So, um, an underlying heart condition can cause us to go into cardiac arrest, but also electrocution. I I really do well learning from visuals and uh, examples. So, um, these are going to be different examples when cardiac arrest was unexpected, um, but happened. So, in the case of Kirkland Harvey, um, we had some unfortunate citizens who were in floodwaters where live electricity was, they went into cardiac arrest. The next is asphyxiation. So think of if you're choking or if you're being pressed upon in the chest, that could send us into cardiac arrest. And the last one is blunt force trauma. So I'll talk about it a little bit more in depth in the next 
couple slides, but um, we have a lot of our youth, our, our youth athletes, uh, who, who go into cardiac arrest after experiencing blunt force trauma by a baseball, a lacrosse, lacrosse. Or being tackled right in the chest. So that is the difference between cardiac arrest and a heart attack. And AEDs are there to analyze the heart, analyze that electrical rhythm, and go a shock if need be. Now, what if you don't have an AED or you're waiting for to go grab it? Well, CPR is really what's needed to incorporate with an AED in order to treat that person immediately. Uh, next slide, please. The American Heart Association says that if nine out of 10 of us were to go into cardiac arrest and within the first minute, CPR and an AED were used, we could survive, nine out of 10. So an AED, like we talked about, and we'll talk further, is going to analyze and help resolve the electrical malfunction. But what is CPR doing, right? I go back to the medical TV dramas. If you've ever watched uh, Grey's Anatomy, I think, makes me cringe when they do CPR. Because obviously the actors are alive. They don't need it. But when we go into cardiac arrest and our heart is fibrillating or quivering, our brain and our other vital organs aren't getting oxygenated blood. So what the CPR is doing is it's buying time uh, for our heart to get back to normal and delivering oxygen to our brain, and most importantly, our brain, uh, until our, our heart is beating again. So you'll see this top statistic, only 50% of non-responsive non victims. You could bring an AED on everybody that went into cardiac arrest. Sometimes it will shock, sometimes it won't. Either way, they're not breathing and their brains need oxygen. So CPR is so important. The visual on the right highlights survivability when just, a C just CPR is done combined with CPR and an AED. So as you can see, it's incredibly important that not only we bring an AED, but that we have somebody who's performing high quality CPR when someone is in need of it most. Next slide. Kelly, I'm gonna interrupt you for one second. Yeah. Um, if everyone could please mute themselves. Um, if you do not mute, um, you will be kicked out of the presentation. And um, that being said, Kelly, I'm going to just hit mute all and then I'm going to unmute you. So I'm hoping that will work. All right, I unmuted myself. I hope that's okay. I do appreciate all, all the active microphones. I love it. I'm, hopefully it means that they wanna ask a bunch of questions at the end. So I'll jump back in, Amber, is that okay? You are good to go, thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. All righty. So uh, know the facts. You know, in 2018, the American Heart Association reported that in the United States alone, there were over 356,000 victims of cardiac arrest. 90% of those, unfortunately, did not survive. So again, the, the need and urgency for uh, AEDs is significant, to say the least. The box is the one individual out of 10 on average that survive those 350,000 cardiac arrest events a year. When we combine the use of CPR and an AED within those first critical minutes, we can have upwards of five out of 10 people surviving and living to tell their story. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, blunt force trauma and student athletes. So not only are there 350,000 victims a year or events a year, but this is also the number one killer of our student athletes. So Schools uh, have AEDs, have had AED laws in some states for many years to try to help prevent or mitigate whenever these events happen. But 10,000 of, out of those 350,000 are also happening in our place of work. So if, if AEDs are, are so important, if we need them within those first few minutes, there have then been reports and studies done of, of folks in the workplace asking them, do you know where your nearest AED is? And, and I'd question everybody on the call. I know you can't come off of mute, but I mean, think to yourself, wherever you work day to day, now granted, 
you might work in your own house, so that's probably an easy question to answer, but think about where you spend most of your time throughout the day other than your house. Do you know where the nearest AED is to you? Do you know if there is an AED? And so that statistic at the bottom left is really highlighting if only one out of 10 survive without an AED, five out of 10 might be able to, but only half of us even know where AEDs are to begin with, we're really not setting ourselves up for success. The bottom right statistic, you know, I mentioned one of the other contributing factors to us going into cardiac arrest is, is heart damage or an underlying heart condition. And now there are a lot more folks walking around day to day that could theoretically be perfectly healthy, may have been recovering from COVID or weeks after recovery. And what we're seeing is that there is a lot of long-term heart damage that could again contribute or increase the likelihood that they might experience a sudden cardiac arrest. Again, just reinforcing the importance of knowing where AEDs are in your workplace, or maybe if it's up to you, deploying AEDs and making sure that everybody around us knows where they are and why they might need them. Next slide, please, Kristen. All right, so this is a little bit redundant, but it's, it's not meant to be. I'm just trying to drive home the fact that an AED or automated external defibrillator, it is a medical device, but it is meant to be used by non-medical folks. It is meant to be so easy, user-friendly, incredibly portable. Um, they typically weigh between you know three to six or seven pounds on average. They're meant to be taken everywhere and used by anyone. And it is going to analyze on its own, not with the help of, of a human, but it on its own will analyze our heart, determine and assess that electrical malfunction and deliver a controlled shock if need be. Next slide, please. So the therapy or shock that's delivered, it is, you know, I mentioned when the heart is fibrillating, it's an uncontrolled quiver, if you will. There's electrical spasms happening internally and the rest of our body is just limp waiting. Well, when that AED is assessing and analyzing, if you notice the bottom visual, it's like a three lead or a, a heart strip, our heart beat, as you can tell, that's not normal. It's just going wild, it's going crazy. Well, the AED is going to assess that and really perform like a computer control alt delete. It's gonna stop everything very briefly and then it's going to allow the heart to reorganize and reestablish our normal or our normal sinus rhythm or heartbeat, which you'll see on the on the right side of that three lead. Which at that point, uh, when our heart's beating, blood would be pumping, um, and oftentimes uh, folks can even wake up right there when you're doing CPR on them, and uh, they'll tell you pretty quickly if you're doing CPR and they don't need it anymore. So next slide, please. The Zola Advantage. So I wanted to give you a, a few specific examples of AEDs that are available to you today. Now, there are a number more than the, the three we'll talk about here, but these are the three that Zoll offers. And so um, I had to, to talk for a few minutes to give you an idea of the differences between these three, if anything, to show you that there are going to be a lot of similarities with AEDs. Every AED theoretically does the exact same thing. The, the importance is more so having one, not necessarily which one do you have. Um, so with our Zola AEDs in particular, you know, I talked a lot about CPR and how just CPR alone, we know increases survivability. Well, in those instances, when we bring an AED to someone, it, it analyzes maybe a shock or a shock isn't needed because of the fact that CPR is always 100% of the time needed, we want our AED to be able to help support that rescuer during those moments as well. CPR is the most daunting part of helping save someone who's in cardiac arrest. You are having to take your hands, press into someone's rib cage in their chest, inches uh, at 100 beats per minute. So you think of the song, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. I don't have a great singing voice and because I can't see any of your faces, I will um, save you all from me singing the song, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. But if you could think about it in your head, it is that rhythm that we will have to press 
two inches into someone, maybe it's a friend or a family member, maybe it's a stranger, uh, CPR is daunting. So our three AEDs each utilize the guidelines that are driven by the American Heart Association to not only monitor those compressions, but provide feedback so that you can correct them if need be. The statistic at the top um, highlights, it was a Dr. Bob Rose study done in Mesa, Arizona. And what that study showed over the course, course of four years was that using the same equipment with and without CPR feedback, and these are first responders, so folks that are doing CPR day in, day out, every day. When CPR feedback was turned on, their victims, the, the calls that they went on, people were more than twice as likely to survive. Survivability more than doubled with CPR feedback. So regardless of the shock, it was just them getting feedback on, are they doing CPR well enough? Now, before we go to the next slide, I'd just like to point out the, the images that you see at the bottom of the screen. Those are the electrodes or the pads, if you will, that you would be opening up and placing directly on someone's chest. So you'd have to remove their clothing, place those on the patient's chest. And normally with AEDs other than these three, you would just do CPR and you would hope you're doing it correctly. You, you know, it could be 10, 15, 20 minutes. Hopefully it's not that long, but if it is, you would have to be doing it and rely solely on whatever training you may or may not have had. Next slide, please. But with each of our AEDs, there is technology, accelerometer technology specifically. Think about our iPhones, right? How they can, or any phone nowadays, it can tell when we're moving around. I think we can do like workouts and it knows exactly what we're doing. That technology is built into the pads themselves with each of these three AEDs. Uh, and it's gonna provide, like I said, corrective feedback in the event that you need it and only in the event you need it. So um, briefly, I'll, I'll take you through the three. So the AED Plus it is our longest serving, longest tenured uh, flagship model, if you will. And it has, again, CPR feedback, very easy to read, uh, pictures that go in a circle. So when I say user-friendly, I mean, it doesn't get any easier, right? You are gonna stick this one set of pads right on the chest and it's going to know if you haven't begun CPR. It will tell you begin CPR. And then if you're not pressing hard enough, it will provide two prompts. It will continue to say push harder until you are pushing deep enough into the chest, at which point it'll say good compressions. The PowerHeart G5, the AED in the middle, has a few unique features, um, specifically at the press of a button, it can be speaking or you can read on the text display in English or in Spanish. Now for this, the CPR feedback is a little bit more comprehensive. So it will not only say to press softer, press slower or press faster, but it will also say press harder and fully release. So you're really getting a full picture of, am I giving this person the best chance of a favorable outcome? Now with our newest AED, the one on the far right, our Zola AED3, there you are going to actually have a, a large colored touch screen that's going to identify exactly where those pads should be placed. Just to help, again, reinforce that sense of uh, peace of mind, sense of confidence that you're putting the pads in the correct um, positioning. And then as you're doing compressions, there's that color bar graph on the screen itself that you'll be able to look at and identify, am I going deep enough? If not, similar to the AED+, Plus, the AED will tell us to push harder until we're pushing hard enough, at which point it'll say good compressions. Um, next slide, please. Now, there will be an opportunity later for more Q&A. So uh, Amber mentioned it, but please, by all means, um, send in a, a text or a, a message, whatever it's called, uh, with your questions. We'd love to answer them all. These are four that we get often, and so we figure we might as well knock these out um, before we move on to the next part of the presentation. So first, how long can I keep an AED for? You know, realistically, AEDs, uh, we see them in the market anywhere between 10 to 15 years, realistically, so long as they're maintained uh, properly. Now, the one thing to, to keep in mind is every AED has a different warranty term. So based on the manufacturer, you would want to ask them directly, how long is my warranty good for? And really what the warranty is going to determine is 
if something were to break or to go wrong, if there was a, an issue that needed resolving, that warranty would allow for uh, the price to fix it uh, to be covered by the manufacturer. So some folks might replace at the end of the warranty. They don't want to risk having to pay for anything if something breaks. Um, but like I said, some folks can keep their AEDs upwards of 10, 12, 15 years uh, if they are ensuring a, a proper maintenance schedule. Well, having an AED be a liability to my business. So as of 20, 2010, um, all 50 states have enacted some form of guideline or regulation uh, surrounding and enabling broader AED usage and deployment. So some states are a little bit more specific around the maintenance. Some states are more specific uh, around who you have to communicate your AED to as far as EMS, et cetera. Um, but overall, the laws are only uh, enabling and endorsing more AEDs. Whether it's OSHA, American Heart Association, um, et cetera, all governing bodies endorse the use of AEDs. They are the standard of care and it has been determined time and time again, they can only help victims of sudden cardiac arrest. So really not having an AED could potentially pose a liability since the standard of care is to have one. Um, but if you do have an AED, as long as you're maintaining it properly, it's not going to add any liability. How many AEDs do I need? This one, I would say it's going to be really specific. There is no clear black or white answer because it's all about the amount of time it takes you to get to an AED in your building. American Heart says, ideally, drop to shock time. So if someone goes down, you should ideally have an AED by their side within three minutes, which means where can you get in 90 seconds and back in 90 seconds? Uh, some buildings that might only necessitate one AED. Where you start to need more is uh, if there are doors or secure access points of entry. So if I have a key card that only gets me past door one, but not past door two, that's where you'd want to consider maybe we need an AED on both sides of that door uh, in the event that someone couldn't, couldn't access or couldn't get past it. Also too, if you're in a school setting or anywhere where there might be a fire drill uh, or a lockdown uh, code activated, again, think about which doors are going to be locked permanently. It's all about access. And I would say just reach out, consult with your local partners. Um, and normally we would do a site assessment at your building or facility with just a, a stopwatch, very easy. Can you hurt someone while using an AED? This one is, is really, I love the, the pink bubble. If you reference the pink bubble with AED being a liability, because AEDs are only uh, going to help save somebody and because they are the standard of care, they don't add any liability. And to dig deeper, they cannot hurt anybody. So if a shock is not needed, the AED will not deliver electricity. Now, granted, if you're touching somebody and an AED is used and they're shocked, if you're still touching them, you could catch some of that electricity. But as far as the person that is in distress, the person uh, who needs our help the most in that moment, the AED is not going to hurt them. The only thing that will hurt them is really not getting an AED fast enough uh, or not having one or no CPR being given. Next slide, please. Now, this is my favorite part of today. Um, buckle up, everybody, because really best case scenario, at least what gets me up in the mornings and what keeps me up at night is uh, opportunities and stories like the one you're about to hear. Um, so I'd like to pass off the microphone to my colleague, and friend, Damien Dollard. Damien? Thank you, Kelly, I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Damien Dollard, and um, I've been with uh, Zoll for about six years and um, been selling AEDs for about 16 years. Um, I am a channel partner manager, and um, this story starts April, eighth of last year. Um, I'd never used an AED before in a person, um, been selling them, but have never used them. And I know that we've all been told, you know, things happen for a reason. Um, after talking through this with um, Anthony and Nicole for about 
close to a year now, um, I finally actually got all my thoughts together. And um, it's like a puzzle, finally putting the pieces together. Uh, because this story actually doesn't start on April 8th. It really starts on April 7th. Because I was actually about an hour and a half away in a town called Stewart, Florida. And um, I had meetings um, that were at about 5.15 and I had dinner plans. And um, the person I was gonna have dinner with um, actually had to postpone or cancel because something came up with his family. So I decided, all right, well, I'll drive about an hour and a half and um, see if I can find a hotel in Melbourne. And um, I found a hotel, the Hilton, and um, on my way there, I called my um, appointment that I was gonna have the next day. And I said, hey, um, would you mind meeting me at the hotel um, instead of Starbucks? And um, he said, sure. So we scheduled to meet at 10. And um, on the 8th, I wake up that morning and um, it's like a typical day, but um, about 9.45, something told me to just go outside to my car, um, just take a breath of fresh air before my meeting. And um, as soon as I walked through the doors, um, I noticed that there was a gentleman going down and he was with another gentleman that as I approached, looked up at me and um, gave me a look that I've never seen before. And um, I immediately ran back in and told them to call 911. Um, <clears throat> it was after that point that I ran back outside to see if I can help. And um, for about 30 seconds or so, um, I was able to figure out, okay, uh, he's no longer breathing. And this was at the trunk of my car. Um, I just reached around and popped the trunk of my car and um, pulled out the AED and I applied it to him and within eight to 10 seconds, it actually advised the shock and it shocked him. Um, then asked me to start CPR and I started CPR. And um, I'd never done CPR on a person before. I've done it on mannequins and it was, it was different and difficult. And um, about a minute and 41 seconds of CPR, the AED actually told me twice to push harder push harder. And at minute and 41 seconds, he opened his eyes and took his next breath of life. And um, we are forever uh, bonded. And um, uh, it was a life changing experience, of course. And Anthony's here today to uh, share uh, his side of the story. And he's with his wife, Nicole. And um, just um, so happy that I was at the right place at the right time and um, was fortunate to meet a wonderful family and now a new wonderful best friend. Thank you, Damien. Uh, nice to meet everybody. My name is Anthony Battaglia and uh, I'm 42 years old and I'm a sudden cardiac arrest survivor. Uh, I never thought I'd be saying that, but it's kind of crazy. I was, I was an athlete growing up. I was a ball player. And uh, I never thought I'd be having so many heart problems. My wife will fill you in on that after. But like Damien said, it was a Thursday morning, sunny day in Florida. And I pulled into the parking lot. I met my colleague. And uh, I was literally going into the back of my car. I did a trade show the night before. I pulled out my suitcase. And uh, I, I just hit the ground. My heart was pounding so hard. I felt like it was going to come out of my chest. And I remember hearing voices. It was my colleague communicating with Damien. Um, and then everything just went white and the voices got quieter and quieter. And that's when I guess, you know, everything was done. Um, I came out of it. I had pick lines coming out of my arms. I remember I, I think I told Damien that I, he was pushing on my chest so hard. I think I told him to stop. Uh, <laughs> it's when I came out of it and, you know, he, he saved my life. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm beyond grateful. I got four little kids and I put two feet on the ground every day because of him. I'm beyond grateful. He's going to be my best friend the rest of my life and I love him to death. I can't say anything more about him than I'm just, I'm beyond grateful. And I thank him. Nicole? Well, while we wait for Nicole, 
um, obviously this um, encounter was something that we, we never anticipated, but um, you know, we've had the true blessings of our family uh, traveling to uh, New Jersey and spending some time with Anthony and his family um, on both sides. Um, and um, it's been a true friendship. And, you know, it just goes to show you, you know, um, being able to have confidence in, in, in doing the right thing and, and being in the right place. And if it wasn't for um, me having the AD in the trunk and also for me, getting that um, feedback to push harder. Um, you know, I was scared to death and um, I'd never been, uh, you know, in a situation like that before, but I uh, was so thankful that uh, we had such a wonderful and positive outcome. I think you may be able to hear me now. There you are. We got you, Nicole. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, every single time we share this story, over the past almost year, um, I think it touches all of us and, and it takes our breath away and it's our story. So to hear it on the other side, I hope that we can impact you as much as it impacts us every day because the fact that Damien was placed where he was on April 8th, the fact that my husband had slept through the night in his hotel room and come down the steps and gone outside. It could have happened any time, but for some reason, Damien was told to go outside and my husband went down at the foot of his car and his AED was in the trunk and the AED that told him to push harder and after a minute and 48 seconds saved his life. We are forever grateful to Damien, to the AED that saved him. Um, and the friendship and the connection that we all have now um, and that we can continue to raise our family and have my husband be a part of our lives. So thank you truly for listening to our story and I hope it impacts you as, as much as it has for us. There he is. <laughs> Sorry, I, th I thought mine was on. <laughs> it was on preview. <laughs> There's nothing better than seeing that smiling face from Damian Dollard. <laughs> I thought you wanted the spotlight to be on, on Anthony and Nicole, which I get it. You know what I mean? But I, I was hoping that you turned on for at least a second so everybody could know that you're a real person. <laughs> Listen, he's the true hero, Kelly. We need the spotlight on him. We're just along no. for the ride. It's all about him. <laughs> No, you're you're all here. Thank you, thank you again. And I mean, I know we we have some questions that have come in, all related to AEDs. But while we have Anthony, Nicole, and Damien, I mean, if you guys have any questions also um, for them, I mean, this this is a unique opportunity. Uh, one out of ten folks are, are Anthony, right? We only get one out of ten Anthony's. Um, and so, you know, again, thank you to you to the three of you, um, but especially Anthony and Nicole for being willing to to come on and have the courage to share your story, um, you know, on the worst day of your life, right? Uh, but so if anybody has a quick question for them, I mean, you're more than welcome to type it in. Amber's been um, submitting them, but um, if not, I know that you guys have, uh, uh, you know, want to be sensitive to your time and I can jump into uh, the AED question specifically. So Amber, if you want to, if you want to jump on and, and, and help direct, cause I could just chat here and talk with Damien and Anthony for way longer than this webinar is scheduled. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I haven't seen any questions um, for Damien and Anthony. So I think we can just jump into the live Q&A um, for AEDs. Um, Kelly, would you like me to read them to you or do you have them pulled up? So I have them pulled up. I have my little handy dandy. Uh, <laughs> I wrote some of these down. So. I guess I, I would just ask if there are any that I miss, you know, if you could just let me know. Um, I did see one that just come, came through, so I'll start with there. Uh, are these able to be portable, like in a saddlebag on a horse? So um, absolutely. Now, I love the idea of a saddlebag on a horse because my mind goes to Yellowstone, um, but we actually have a lot of folks in Texas specifically out on their ranches, um, that will take AEDs with them um, as they're going hunting, um, camping, but but really they can be used anywhere. So um, in a backpack, you could carry it, you could create some sort of strap. I mean, like I said, they average between 
three and a half, four to seven ish pounds. Um, but you could theoretically bring them uh, anywhere and everywhere. So a big saddlebag, it could certainly be carried along. Uh, we had a question about the CPR feedback and whether or not it would also work on pediatric patients. So for those of you that um, are wondering, you know, what determines a pediatric patient or the need for pediatric pads, uh, the American Heart says 50 pounds or less or eight years or younger, if pediatric pads are available, it's recommended that you use those. If pediatric pads aren't available, uh, it's recommended that you just stick with the adult and use those as quickly as possible. And really what the pediatric pad is doing is attenuating or limiting the amount of electricity um, that a kiddo would get. But again, anything is better than nothing. So in the event that you don't have pediatric pads, use the adult. The CPR feedback uh, specifically would not be turned on for the use case in a pediatric individual, simply because it's really looking at two to 2.4 inches of depth uh, into the chest. And so for a pediatric or anybody else, the, the goal is a third of the depth of their chest, which a lot of small humans, um, a third of the chest would not reach that two to 2.4 inches. And so that PD, or the CPR feedback would be turned off so as not to instruct you to press harder and then thereby uh, potentially hurting them even more. Um, do you stop CPR when shock is advised? So there are semi-automatic and automatic AEDs. Uh, decades ago, the only AEDs that existed required you to press a button to deliver shock. So back then it was very easy. It was like, if you're about to press the button, everybody stand clear of the patient. Well, now there's automatic AEDs. And I, and I would say almost 100% of the AEDs I see in the public are automatic, which it removes the need for you to press a button. Basically, if a shock is needed, it's gonna do it on its own. Now the AEDs will give you a countdown. It will say, do not touch patient, stand back, anything along those lines, and it'll give you a countdown. Shock will be delivered in three. Before it gets to one, you should uh, stop doing CPR and back up just to be safe. Now, there are some AEDs or some trains of thought that CPR must be maintained throughout the shock analysis and delivery. Um, I would say just consult with your local medical director or a physician, um, but the standard of care is to stop CPR and allow the AED to analyze and shock and then continue CPR after that. Uh, how has Zoll been impacted by supply chain? Um, now, I wish I knew who asked that question because uh, it is a very relevant topic. So the supply chain challenges have affected everything from my favorite Coca-Cola Zero product um, to dips at Chick-fil-A to AEDs. And so we, it has affected us, it has impacted us. Um, and we are seeing extended lead times. Um, what we are seeing most often and most consistently is that there is no consistency uh, with our lead times and our, our, our product supply. So um, there is nothing that we can't get theoretically. It's just either stuck on a boat or stuck on a bus, stuck on a plane, um, et cetera. So COVID continues to impact um, personnel and working environments across the world. And we, along with uh, others in our industry and others in every industry, continue to be impacted. I think the question also said, when do we see the light? When do we see it changing? If it were up to me, uh, it would be yesterday, uh, but it's not up to me. And so I think, again, I go back to that. The only consistent part about our challenges have been the inconsistencies and I think it's better safe than sorry to assume it's going to go on for a while. Um, we're hoping that uh, as we find new ways to source and address some challenges, we can help get equipment out to our customers quicker. But um, I would hate to say something on this call and then be held to it because really it is totally out of my hands and out of my control. So I have no idea. There was a question related to, um, you know, maybe on a boat or in an environment where there's water. And uh, let's say someone's brought up from the water. So there's obviously a, they're in a puddle. You guys are both probably wet. Uh, and there was a question, you know, what would we do in that case, right? Obviously electricity and water don't go well together. And the last thing we want is to put both of you in, you know, even worse conditions. I will first start with 
this is where AED and CPR certification and training comes in because you will have a, a certified trainer that can reference and show you the specific rules and guidelines and processes for all different uh, maybe one-off scenarios. But in this setting, what I will say is the most important thing is that the individual or person, their chest is as dry as possible. So whether that's water, blood, vomit, et cetera, we wanna make sure they're dry as possible and remove from standing water if, if we can, right? Um, outside of that, if there's a specific amount of standing water, again, I would say, uh, I would have you ask whoever you received your training from or a, a local medical director or authority um, uh, from a medical standpoint and at your place of work or wherever you live. Let's see. Does Zoll offer physician services to meet some of the state requirements? So, and I forgot to mention this. There are two things that sometimes get confused as one. Uh, there's the AED prescription, and then there is the medical director or physician oversight of an AED program, which I assume that question was asking. But there is also the prescription, which sometimes folks call in and they're wondering, you know, I don't have a prescription, but I need an AED, and there's some concern there. Um, I will say all of us AED manufacturers will provide prescriptions at the time of purchase of a new FDA approved AED. The prescription is, is less like you would get when you get your medicine and you have a prescription from your doctor. It's, it's not like that as much as it is just a, a formality from the FDA that what we have made is according to their guidelines. Now, medical oversight uh, does require a physician to sign off or essentially authorize that a program is compliant. There are local, um, local physicians and providers, some city, county EMS agencies will provide that. Zoll does have uh, service offerings that could provide that, but um, there are lots of them. So I think that the whole market has just tried to create resources so that customers are more likely to get AEDs and feel safe and confident. So short answer, uh, which I already gave you the long answer. Sorry, I am a talker. But short answer is yes, Zoll does offer those. Let's see. Um, if no one, oh, wow, there's a couple questions. Apologize. Are the batteries for the AEDs rechargeable? So to my understanding, no AEDs in the market right now have a rechargeable battery. Um, some uh, of the batteries are consumer grade, so you can easily get them uh, from a local store or uh, from AED Superstore or wherever have you, but some are more commercial grade, um, medical grade lithium ion batteries, but each of them have a different length of time, so they can last anywhere from two to five years, um, of course, based on maintenance and how often you've had to use them, but um, when they expire, they would need to be replaced. What is the maintenance schedule like for AEDs? Are they serviceable by the owner? Do they have to be sent back to Zoll or do we have to hire a technician? So maintenance schedule for all AEDs uh, as R3, um, we will always recommend in every 30 day, at least a visual inspection. Some states like the state of Texas just passed a law where that's required. A visual 30 day inspection is required. Some states don't have that requirement. Again, I will start with wherever you live locally, that's what you'd want to reference first, and then consult with the manufacturer about your specific AED. Um, but best practice would be an every 30 day visual. Um, some folks like to have a more hands-on where they're really getting in the unit, um, but every AED is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, serviceable as far as replacing the pads and batteries, that can be done by the owner themselves. It doesn't have to uh, have any you know, higher certification or technician status to change out the pads and batteries. You're, you're entirely capable of doing it on your own. Um, I just think it's always best if you have AEDs currently or if you're looking at them to really make sure uh, you confirm with the manufacturer how often do these pads or batteries need to be replaced. That can be anywhere between two to five years. Um, Storage of AEDs, recommended to keep them indoors in Michigan. So uh, the state of Indiana, for example, I think there's over, man, I wish Damien were to jump back on. Um, almost every state patrol vehicle in the state of Indiana has an AED in the back of their car. And it obviously gets a lot colder than 30, than 
32 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, we'll say is just keep an eye on them, right? AEDs, each of them. Damien, do you remember? I know Florida has how many patrol cars? Uh, what is it, like 90% of the patrol vehicles in the state of Florida have AEDs? Correct, correct. So that's where you'll, we get both ends of the spectrum, right? Hot and cold. Now, with hot, those pads could maybe dry out sooner. The batteries, you want to make sure that they're not in, you know, uh, over 140 degrees for five days or longer. But on the Indiana or Michigan, our cold weather states, at 32 degrees or less, those pads could theoretically freeze. It's a water-based gel. So I would, again, um, keep an eye on whichever AED you have, there should be a, a ready indicator. So for ours, it's either a green check mark or a green circle. Um, if the AED is not ready to use or if there's uh, service required, just keep an eye and know that uh, the AED will also help alert you. But safe to, if you're going to be in the, in the house overnight and it's zero degrees, maybe we bring it in. But um, they can withstand very uh, adverse environments and conditions, and they're built for that. All right, Kelly, I think we'll have time for one more before we have to announce our winner. Um, the rest Ooh, of the questions, I will get um, answers out to all of you um, after the presentation. Perfect. So um, can I answer like one and a half? Because one question is also just like this last one with the, with the beep. Okay, so I, I noticed <laughs> someone that cold winter weather, their AEDs are beeping. I have nightmares about those beeps. Um, you know, so that's good that you're hearing it. The beep means something is required. Um, whoever manufactured the AED, I would just say call them directly, their tech support, and they'll be able to help get rid of that chime. Because not only is it annoying, it means that uh, service is required and it, it might not be ready to use. So um, if someone goes into severe AFib, no other options, can a person hook up the AED? Um, so that question, man, this would be my last one. This is kind of tricky. So I do not have the uh, ability or um, acronyms after my name, the education to tell you, you can use an AED on yourself. So we'll start there. I will say that if you have a unique condition or you're worried that you might find yourself in a particular uh, environment like this one where an AED is your only option, I would just consult with a physician or a cardiologist, electrophysiologist, tell, and then ask them. I know that AEDs, they tell a story, right? We saw one second clip of a, of a three lead EKG, but when an AED is on, it's taking a story the entire time. So it's not going to shock unless need be, but at the very least, it will collect that story of what's going on. Um, so uh, I, I would say just, I want to say an answer from Kelly Parker, but I would say best case to reach out to a physician and ask them specifically. All right. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you everyone for your great questions. Like I said, we will um, be getting back to all of you with the answers for those. So um, now it is time to announce the winner of our giveaway. The winner is Julie Saunders. Um, I will be reaching out to you um, right after this to get your shipping information. So please stay on for just a few minutes. Um, for those of you who did not win um, and are looking to purchase an AED, we are offering a webinar exclusive discount of $300 each whole AED plus business package. You can use WebZ300 to save. If you do have further questions or like would like one of our experts to contact you about AED solutions for your business, please email, put your email address and phone number into the chat and we will connect you with a team member. We hope you enjoyed our What is an AED webinar and would like to thank you for joining us today.